Good morning and welcome to our last session in Romans. Uh, today we will be picking up where we left off last week from chapters 12 and 13. We talked about what does it mean to take all of what Paul has been talking about and begin to put it into practice. What does it mean uh, to live in, in and under the Lordship of Jesus? What does it mean to have what we've heard change the way we see the world uh, and begin to look at not, not only the outside world but the inside world of the church with new eyes? So today we continue that conversation as Paul moves from the end of chapter um, 13 uh, from looking outside the world uh, to those that live, in, live around us. How do we get along with them? How do we live in uh, harmony? Back now inside the church. So Paul is writing to the church in Rome and we'll, we'll learn more about some of who he knows as we get to the end of the letter. But Paul has also been in churches like the church in Corinth and Galatia. And if you read those letters, Paul understands some of the, the difficulties of this new community. A community filled with Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, filled with different cultures and ethnicities, filled with different traditions. And Paul understands that little things can become big things. And little things can begin to break up unity within the body. And it can be the things that we might consider, uh, one person may consider as inconsequential, and somebody else may deem it as necessary for their faith. Um, and these aren't maybe what we would consider doctrinal issues. These are kind of the issues that we would say are periphery issues, more cultural issues. Uh, and we'll talk more about maybe some of the ways that we look at that in our church today. But let's listen uh, to chapter 14. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. And those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. So two basic things that we'll hear today in 14 verses 1 through at least 6 begins with eating and special days. So verse 5, let's listen to those. Some judge one day to be better than the other, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. So Paul's writing to a community that whether they are Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians, they view things differently. So in the ancient world, in somewhere like Rome, for instance, if you were to go buy meat at the market, you knew that that meat, before it had gotten to the market, had gone to a temple, had been sacrificed to a god, and whatever was left over was taken to the market to be sold. Now, for somebody like Paul, who sees that, you know, certain things in and of themselves aren't necessarily idol worship. So Paul has already come to the conclusion it's okay to eat certain things. Paul sees himself as being strong in faith. He's moved beyond some of those smaller things. But there are some people who say, I can't eat this meat knowing good and well that it was sacrificed to an idol. For me, that is almost like being there when they did it. So, in a place like Rome, if you don't eat any meat, guess what? You're a vegetarian. Now, there's some people that maybe they've grown up uh, as a Gentile and the practice of eating meat is just who they are. So, going to the market to buy meat, for them, they've given up the idol 
they serve Jesus and for them there's no problem in it there are some Jews who have seen that because of the Lordship of Jesus it's okay like Paul to go out and buy the meat and eat it but there are some people that you know what you say you love Jesus you're still buying meat worship to idols and other people are saying, well, you idiot, it doesn't mean anything. It's just food. You eat it. Jesus says it's not what goes inside of you, it's what comes out. So within the community, you've got maybe a group of people that are frustrated with each other because they're not all on the same page. They're differing in their opinion. Then you've got some that are, are Jewish Christians who are still observing the, the holy days of Israel. And those Gentile Christians are saying, I don't necessarily want to do that. For, he, for us, every day is a day to the Lord. There's not one day that's more special than the other. Paul says, if you want to observe those days and you do it because you honor God, do it. If you eat certain foods and you bless the meal and you're honoring God by doing it, do it. If you abstain because you're honoring God, honor God and do it. Don't quarrel over these things. And Paul says, the reason we don't quarrel over these things, in verse 7, we do not live to ourselves. And we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so that He might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Realization is you don't live for yourself. You live for Christ. And everything you do should be centered in that. So if you think honoring Christ does, means this, then do it. And if you think honoring Christ means this, then do it. But understand everything you do should be done in honor of the one who has died and resurrected, who now lives in you. So why do you pass judgment on your brothers and sisters? So Paul's been around to enough churches to understand that even Rome is going to have these issues that somebody within your community, you're going to start to judge based on how they're living out their faith. Why do you despise your brother or sister? You know, if somebody constantly is telling you that you're doing something wrong, or you just see it in their eyes. You ever experienced that? Or the assumption is maybe you perceive somebody judging you and they're not really judging you, but because you think of it, you feel what? Shameful. You know, I've been to restaurants and seen people at our church and maybe they've got a, a drink. And they assume that I'm going to judge them based on that. So they try to hide it. <laughs> I'm not there to do that. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Now Paul's already talked about earlier in Romans about all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But in Christ we can stand with confidence because of what Christ has done. So the realization as we live in this new community, how are we to begin to put ourselves in the place of God amongst other believers? with the realization is how I live my faith will be reckoned as righteousness to God through Christ, but understanding it, it is to God to whom I'm ultimately accountable.
Not to my brothers or my sisters. But that also means I can't pass judgment on my brothers and sisters because at the end of the day, I'm still accountable to God. Not to them. I've got to live faithfully, loyally to Christ in the way that I feel God leading me in my life. And at the end of the day, I will be judged by God alone. Therefore, no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. Now, Paul's not writing about doing some crazy stuff. In 1 Corinthians, he pretty much challenges somebody that they can no longer be a part of the church because, well, they're having relationships with their family members. And there's certain things Paul says is off limits. So he's not talking about, you know, somebody that's in a, a full-out sinful lifestyle. But he's talking about those matters of faith that are peripheral to the Lordship of Jesus in our lives. And for those things, we have to be careful on how we love one another by not putting stumbling blocks or hindrances in the way of one another. I know I'm persuaded in the Lord that nothing is unclean in and of itself. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. And it's hard for us to think about certain foods as being unclean or clean. I mean, most of us, um, if you put it in front of us, we're going to eat it. I mean, they're taboo foods. I mean, most of us don't eat rats. But there are people around the world that do. Uh, most of us don't eat certain kinds of animals like bugs, but there are certain people do. But it's more taboo. It's not that you can't do it. Nobody says you can't eat it. I mean, there's somebody probably in New York City paying a lot of money to eat stuff we would think is gross because they think it's, you know. But in this day and time, you can't eat certain foods. If you're a, a, a Jew who is practicing tradition, you can't eat pork. You can't eat certain seafoods. Paul has been eating at Gentile tables with Gentile meals and understands that a part of the new community of faith is that Jesus has come fulfilled the law and that we are living in Christ in a new way. And that certain things from that old covenant, you know, doctrinal things that that try to keep Israel. Israel is no longer, it's the church now, and the church lives in this new world. And certain things, just like in Acts, when, when um, Peter sees the tent sheet coming down, and, and, and Jesus says to him, what I've made uh, clean, you can't make unclean. Um, here, Paul knows for himself that nothing is unclean. Nothing that he eats is necessarily profane. But he understands that somebody sitting beside him may not think that way. And for him to go and sit at a meal and, and maybe they have a potluck dinner. And he knows that they're not going to eat food, meat, sacrificed, and he brings spare ribs to their house. That's going to cause a problem. So in their company, what's Paul going to do? He's probably going to abstain. He's not going to put a stumbling block in front of them to have a negative reaction to cause disunity amongst the family. If your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. The love of Christ is self-sacrificing. Sometimes the way that we interact with our brothers and sisters means that we put our own self-interest, our own desires to the side so that we can be walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ has died. So do not let your good be spoken as evil. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The one who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and has human approval. Let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything indeed is clean, but it is wrong for you to make others fall by what you eat. 
It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. So there are certain times, Paul says, that you should, you should refrain from doing certain things in certain people's company. You know, most of us know good etiquette. And um, we know that there are certain people that um, certain things are too much of a temptation for them. So if we're going to serve something, we're not going to put that out in front of them. In the same way, Paul is saying for certain people, when you put these things out in front of them and you ask them to eat, their conscience is telling them not to do it. And if you push them, they're going to start to have questions and doubts. And it's going to be a stumbling block for them to grow in Christ. So don't push them in places they don't need to go. Don't pass judgment on them and don't let them be in a situation where they're going to pass judgment on you. But those who have doubts are condemned if they eat because they do not act from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. You know, if that person comes to your house and you serve in this first century world, you serve them meat and they feel obliged to eat it, but deep down they know it's wrong, then for them that might be sinful. Because it's going to lead them to have a complicated relationship with, with, with their Savior. They're going to feel shame and guilt from it. And sin, that's usually what sin does. So for something that for you doesn't have any kind of effect, for them it could be a stumbling block. We who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So Paul's writing to a community that there are going to be different groups of people. And when he says weak in faith, he's not meaning that, you know, I think a better way of saying it would be mature. Uh, Paul talks about in other writings, spiritual milk instead of eating solid food. Paul says we've got to put up, we've got to hold up those that are weak in their faith not to please ourselves. Paul is asking people to take on the same mind as Christ Jesus. He said the renewing of your mind in chapter 12, he says in Philippians, we must be of one mind with Christ Jesus who what? Who empties himself, takes on the form of what? A servant or a slave. With our brothers and sisters, we too ought not to put our own self-interest above others, but to serve others as Christ serves us. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. For Christ did not please himself, but it is written, The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instructions, so by the steadfastness and by the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is writing from all through Romans, the unity of Christ in the church. And part of that is that recognition is that we're all sinners, no whether you're Gentile or Jew, that Christ has died for all, that we all share in the same faith of Abraham. Paul is writing over and over that we are one body. We are one. And the ultimate goal for any church is harmony. Unity. It does not mean that that has to be conformity. We don't all have to be alike. But we have to be united under the Lordship of Jesus. So as Paul continues to write, the understanding that Paul sees is that the church as a whole, and he's going to talk about that as he talks about the collection of the saints. Paul sees his 
his legacy as one who is bringing harmony to the church. Because he sees that it is by the mid-50s and early 60s, there's already enough differences between Gentile and Jewish Christians that there could be a break. And Paul wants the church to be one. And he is working as best he can as uh, a missionary to the Gentiles also to, to reweave what God has been doing in Christ. He says, Welcome one another, therefore just as Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. Part of the mission of the church is always to have arms open. If Christ welcomes you when you were still what? A sinner. When you weren't perfect, how can you not open your arms for others? Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And as it is written, Therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles, and sing praise to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, and again praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let the peoples praise him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, and the one who rises to rule the Gentiles, and him the Gentiles shall have hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Paul ends in, in 13, part of what he's been talking about, about this unity and harmony that comes in knowing Christ, but you've got to live it out in practice. That begins in 12, by the renewing of your mind, by seeing the world differently in Christ, by loving one another as Christ has loved you, by living peaceably among your neighbors, and by looking at your brothers and sisters in faith with the same mind that Christ has. Not seeking to justify yourself, but not putting stumbling blocks in front of others. So then Paul kind of moves from verses 14 to 32, to a little bit of a different train of thought. I myself feel confident about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. So Paul reminds this group of people, although he's written all of this, he doesn't think that they don't know what they're doing in Christ. Because as Paul will list later, he knows a good many people in the Roman church. Nevertheless, on some points I've written to you rather boldly, by way of reminding, because of the grace given me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offerings of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Listen, brothers and sisters, I've been around the block. And even though you may know what you need to know, the same problems that affect the church in Corinth and Galatia are probably affecting you in Rome. I just want you to know, to be clear, this is why I'm writing these things. Because Paul's introducing himself before he gets there, before he hopes to get there. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to boast of my work. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to win obedience from the Gentiles, by word and deed, by powers of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem as far around as Elycrium, I have fully proclaimed the good news of Christ. If we had a map in front of us, Paul would be showing that Paul has been going far and wide, proclaiming the good news to Gentile churches. Some churches he's founded and some churches he's worked alongside of others. 
And Paul's understanding of his mission is that he is to proclaim the good news to those outside of Israel. And we go back and read the story of Acts, we see that within Paul's missionary work, there have been great signs and wonders. Paul's not necessarily bragging, but he wants to make sure that they know that he's got experience. Thus I make it my ambition to proclaim the good news, not where Christ has already been named, so that I do not build on someone else's foundation, but as is in written, those who have never been told of him shall see, and those who have never heard shall understand. This is the reason I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, I desire, as I have for many years, to come to you when I go to Spain. So Paul's essentially saying, there are places eastward outside of the Roman Empire that he could go. But Paul's a Roman citizen. Paul knows the... <laughs> Paul knows the ease of travel to which he has. And Paul says, I have gone everywhere I can go here. But I'm going to come to you on my way to the farthest reaches of the Roman Empire, which was the region, the province, of Spain. I don't think of the country of Spain as it is today, but in the same neck of the woods. And this is the frontier. Paul wants to go to the frontier where, as far as he knows, no one has gone to share the good news. You know, we read about Paul, we hear about Paul, and if we could ask Paul, like many of us who maybe won't, won't plans after we get to a certain age, these are Paul's retirement plans. Paul's going to end his work there in Spain. Now we know a lot of people make retirement plans and it never happens. And this is the same for Paul. But he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen to him. He's got an idea and he'll talk about it. Paul makes it to Rome not in a few weeks, not in a few months, but in two years after he writes this letter, roughly. And it's in chains to the prisoner. It's after many hardships. But this Paul, before he knows all of this, is dreaming a big dream of what God will do with his life. And he dreams that God is going to send him to the furthest reaches of the world. But before he can get there, he's got to go to Rome. He feels like that's the place he needs to go on his way, and logistically it is. But he wants to spend time with this church that's at the heart of the Roman Empire. It's at the heart of those that know that in this world Caesar is emperor. It is a small church in a great big city. And Paul desires very much to go there. For I do hope to see you on my journey and to be sent on by you once I've enjoyed your company for a little while. At present, however, I'm going to go to Jerusalem in the ministry to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have pleased to share their resources with the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. They were pleased to do this, and indeed they owe it to them, for it is the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings. They ought to also be of service to them in material things. So when I have completed this and have delivered to them what they have collected, I will set out by my way to you to Spain. And I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Paul has been preaching in Romans, and we read in Galatians and elsewhere, this unity of the Spirit between Gentile and Jewish Christians. And Paul sees his legacy as bringing these two groups together. You know, we read Romans, and many people read Romans as a theological work about what it is to be, have faith in Christ, to be justified, to be glorified, all of those sorts of things. And I think Paul would say, you've missed the point 
if you don't understand that the reason I write these things, the reason I'm doing these things is because I see these two groups needing to come together to be one church, one body. And Paul, as he's been going along in Asia Minor, he writes two churches, but we know he goes to other places. He's been doing what he heard the apostles ask him, we read in Acts, to remember the poor in Jerusalem. Those Jewish Christians, those brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. So Paul has been collecting an offering. And has been collecting this offering. He's going to take it himself and offer it as an offering to God and to the people in Jerusalem. In many ways, Paul sees himself functioning in a priestly duty. And this offering, in his hopes, will be a sign to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem that those Gentiles that are far away that have never met you are part of the one body of Christ. That what Christ has done is reaching the outer world and we are unifying by the meeting of our needs. And Paul sees this collection that he's taken in many ways as a symbol of his whole work. And it's not enough that he just sends it. He's got to take it. He wants to show those to which he's indebted, those early followers of Jesus. But he also wants to bring them together. I mean, for us, that's a powerful image. These people that have never met you all over, but they heard of you and they're indebted to you and they know that they are rich and you are poor and they are going to what? Offer you to help meet your needs. Paul hopes that this will be a bridge. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in earnest prayers to God on my behalf that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul has this sense of dread. Rightly so. There are people that do not like Paul. There are people within the church that do not like Paul. And there are people on the outside, those other Jews that do not like Paul. And Paul knows that by taking this offering, he's putting himself in a hot plate. When you go and read the story in Acts, you see played out what Paul's fear is. That somebody's going to be out to get him. But even knowing that, Paul still goes. Because he believes deep down, I think, that this offering is a sign of what Christ is doing in the world. Whether you agree with him or don't agree with him, he's wanting to show you these Gentile churches are praying for you. So he asked the church in Rome, pray for me, please. Because he so much wants to meet them. And he says to be refreshed by them. Paul's probably tired. He's constantly been on the move. Sometimes he's at a church for a few days, sometimes for a few years. He's working hard. Not everybody likes him. He's been in prison. He's been beaten up. <clears throat> Paul's hoping by the time he gets to Rome, maybe he can just rest before he heads out on his big mission trip to Spain. So in 16, he begins by talking about those he knows. 
and leaves us with some final greetings. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon or minister of the church in Centria, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you, for she has been a benefactor of many of myself as well. As we read this, I want you to listen to how many names are women's names. You know, Paul gets a bad rap when he writes in certain places about women, but it's usually to a local context, to a local church where things are happening. But in general, Paul is favorable of women in the church, as serving in the church, as being co-laborers in the church. Read Priscilla and Aquila, who worked with me in Christ Jesus, and who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. We read in Acts that Priscilla and Aquila uh, were from Rome, but during that, that time of Claudius, they were Jewish Christians. They were sent out. And they meet Paul. Well, you can read in Acts uh, them working, uh, even Apollos, who's also another uh, evangelist in the early church. They kind of help instruct him a little bit. You can read about him in, in Acts and in 1 Corinthians as well. Uh, you can uh, read about Priscilla and Aquila. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved uh, Epenetus, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard among you. Greet Androchus and Junia, my relatives who are in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Now, whether these are close relatives figuratively or literally, Paul's naming people he knows that we don't have any idea who these people are. But these are important people to Paul who the church in Rome either know or will know before he comes. They also may also represent individual house churches within Rome. He lists a group of five. There might be five house churches in Rome. We also notice their names are both Jewish and Greek. Paul knows that there's a diversity within that church as well. Um, greet Ampelitus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Ernibus, our co-worker in Christ. And my beloved Stachius, greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my relative uh, Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Nocrisius. Greet those workers in the Lord, Teraphina and Teraphius. Greet those beloved Perseus and those who worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and greet his mother, a mother to me also. Greet we don't see people naming kids after these. These are, you know, a lot of names, you know, Bible names. We, we, we you know, get a lot of Jeremiah and Joshua's, but some of these names would be good names, huh? Greet, and I say these names. Y'all don't know if I pronounce them right or not. It's okay. <laughs> uh, greet Asnesnia and uh, Phlegon and Hermes and uh, Petrobus and Hermas and the brothers and sisters who are with them. Greet Philicus and Julia and Nereus and his sisters and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. So Paul begins to end the letter by saying to those that are in Rome, greet them from me. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to keep an eye on those who cause dissension and offense in opposition to the teachings you have learned. Avoid them. So this is the other extreme. The, the minor extreme is those who disagree over certain things. There are some that's going to teach things that are different than what Paul's been teaching. Uh, we read in other places, places like the Judaizers who are saying that you've got to be fully Jewish if you're Gentile to be saved. Paul would say avoid them. There are some that we don't know a whole lot about. We read in, let's say, Revelation. Um, there are certain names that are given. We don't know really what they are, but they're obviously teaching something other than what Paul's been teaching and the early church has taught. And Paul would say, just avoid them. For such people do not deserve our Lord Christ, 
but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the simple-minded. For while your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, I want you to be wise in what is good and guileless in what is evil. The God of peace will shortly crush Satan under your feet, and the grace of our Lord Christ will be with you. Then he turns his attention to those that are with him or working around him at the time. Timothy, my co-worker, greets you. So somebody like Priscilla and Aquila, who's reading this letter, know some of these people. And Paul wants to, under, you know, these are people that are important to him. Um, you know, it's almost like when you read a book and you read the, uh, um, the thanks to, to certain people that have helped in the introduction. Paul leaves this for the, for the... So Timothy, my co-worker, greets you. So does Lucius and Jason and Sustifier, my relatives. I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, greet you in the Lord. So Paul uses a scribe. Paul is dictating this letter. And the person that's writing this out in, in, in handwriting... And we've got to imagine how many times Paul and Tertius have been writing this letter. You know, how many copies did they get? You know, what point did, did Paul say, no, we've got to start over? But in the ancient world, it was, it was common for people to speak, to dictate, and have someone write a letter. So we get to know the name. We don't know anything else about this person. But we get to know the person who put pen to paper the letter to the church in Rome. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Eretus, the city treasurer, and our brothers Quartus greet you. So more than likely, Paul is writing um, this letter. Gaius is perhaps the same person in 1 Corinthians that, that he speaks of, so maybe he's writing this as he's in Corinth. Now to you, God, who is able to strengthen you. So he ends with the benediction, concluding blessing. Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through prophetic writings is made known to all Gentiles according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to whom... Be glory forever and ever. Amen. Over the last eight weeks, we have been in Romans. I want, I want to end with a couple concluding thoughts, and then I'm going to pray and, and stop this, and I'd like to hear what you have come away with from the book, from the letter. So when we think about what is Paul saying in this letter to a church that he's not necessarily been to, but he knows certain people from, he's introducing himself before he gets there and his hopes to get there. Um, what is Paul's purpose for this letter? And for me, the purpose of this letter is one, to talk about all of the work that is happening in this early church is because of God's righteousness and goodness and mercy through the faithfulness of Jesus that leads us to have faith in the one true God, knowing that it is nothing that we could do, but only what God has done in Christ. And knowing that it is only what God has done in Christ that welcomes us into this new family, this new community, this new way of living and being in the world. It leaves us without looking at our neighbor as ourselves being better than the other. It leaves us to understand that we are part of one body, one faith, one baptism. And he uses things like looking at Abraham as the father of all. Before there was law, before there was circumcision, there was faith. And that same faith is the faith that we carry in our lives in Christ. And the realization, not everyone is turning to Jesus. And Paul mourns his brothers and sisters of Israel, but understands that God's promises are long-lasting and that we, although he doesn't say it in Romans, he says it in 1 Corinthians, we only see through a glass dimly. 
There is great mystery in what God is doing in Christ. But you know what? We have to not only have faith in it, we have to allow that faith to change who we are. Chapters 12 and 13 give us an image of, of what it is to live with Christ in our lives. Much of what Paul says is not alien to us. We hear it in the Gospels from Jesus Himself. What it means to love your neighbor as yourself. What it means to put others before yourself. What it means to die to self. And then he talks about how do we live in this greater world where not everyone is followers of Jesus, but they suffer just as we suffer. They hurt us just not necessarily because we're Christian, but it's because it's the world. How are we going to treat them? How are we going to live differently than they do? And then he looks back in the church and says, how are we going to live with one another? We're going to disagree. But how are we going to live selflessly, not selfishly? How are we going to live sacrificially? How are we going to live as Christ lives and how are we not going to put stumbling blocks in front of others? And he says all of this as he himself has been collecting an offering to take to Jerusalem to do the very things he's been preaching. Putting faith into action. Trying to bring two desperately different groups together under Christ. So Paul's not just writing something that is an abstract. He's writing what he's living out in his daily life. He's pouring out his heart. And we see in Romans more of what Paul is thinking inwardly than anywhere else. Because Paul's not writing to a church that is, he's having interchanges with and we just get picks up little bits and pieces of it like 1 and 2 Corinthians. Paul gets to write to a church that does not know him fully. And within, embedded in that, there are many, many things we've not covered. But what we've covered is the heart of what Paul is doing in his ministry. He's looking at those on the outside, welcoming them in to the kingdom of God. And he looks within the early church and sees there are brothers and sisters not even welcoming one another. And how are we going to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us in the body as we are asking others to come into the faith? So in many ways, the same struggles that Paul faced, we face today. Let me close this in prayer. And um, as I talk to our group today, we will probably do just a, um, a general overview of something next week and our group here is going to help us choose a, a new Bible study. If you online would like to uh, send an email to me and let me know some things that you would like to, uh, to study, we will look at those as well. But let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for Paul. Lord, he lived 2,000 years ago. And he lived a life that early on in his life was lived in zealous righteousness for the law. But when he met you, everything changed. And his ministry and his work and his writings have influenced and shaped the church for these past 2,000 years. And God, sometimes we read Paul and we get frustrated. And oftentimes our frustration isn't because we aren't reading it right, it's that we don't read it in context. Oftentimes we read letters like Romans in small segments. But God, when we get the bigger picture of Paul's life and Paul's ministry and Paul's heart, we understand it's the heart that has been shaped in Christ. A heart that longs to see harmony and unity in the body. And at the end of the day, he gave his life for it. 
And as we read Romans today in a world that seems to be pulling apart, not just on the outside, but often in the inside of the church, help us seek the same purpose and the same mind of Christ that Paul sought to serve others and bring others closer to one another as we come closer to you. Give us the same fervor and the same passion. We pray all of this in the name of the One, Christ our Lord. Amen.